Hello everyone! Last week we finished up the main storyline for Shadows of Argus, but there are a couple of minor things that didn't flow well with the overall storyline, so those I want to cover today, as well as talk a little bit about what's coming up and speculate about the future. First things first though, on the Vindicar we have a couple of conversations going on with people on the ship. One thing that fans have been waiting to see for a very long time, that is a Windrunner reunion. The moment that Illyria stepped through the dark portal, it was pretty emotional, and she wanted her sisters to have something to remember her by. Varana was charged with bringing her farewell message, as well as two specially crafted necklaces. She melted down a necklace given to her by her parents, and held on to the emerald one, while giving the ruby and the sapphire to Sylvanas and Verisa. A lot has happened in the time that she's been gone. Sylvanas has gone through a whole lot of storyline, which Illyria knows nothing about. She stood against Arthas and the Scourge, trying to defend her kingdom and her people. She's been turned into a banshee and now made war chief of the Horde. How would someone like Illyria react to seeing her sisters again? And this is what we got. Impossible! I refuse to believe she now leads the Horde. Not after all they did to our people during the war. There's more. I'm... I'm not sure how to explain the rest, or if this is even the time or place to... I must know, Verisa. What fate befell our sister? Give me a moment. I will do my best to explain. Perhaps we had best discuss the matter in private. This is not going to be the end of it, I hope anyways, and we'll see more with Sylvanas in the future. Verisa definitely has reasons to hate the Horde, the bombing of Fedamor that took away a Ronin, but it's not the same Horde that Illyria fought against. They literally have the Horde join the Army of the Light in the fight against the Legion. Surely she realizes that this is not the same. You can also check out a pretty fun dialogue with Ketgar, Illyria and Trellian, as well as a conversation with Aethys and Ketgar, and then there's one with Liadrin and Silgrin. So besides these little stay a while and listen conversations, a couple of you mentioned seeing a familiar name near the Circle of Esperance, which is Akama, and you asked what's up with that. How come his spirit is just sitting here while our Akama is still very much alive? I understand the confusion since sometimes they use the term spirit and sometimes they use the term echo, but I say that this is definitely an echo, similar to the echo of Velen and Archimond and Rakish, and pretty much any and all of these ghostly beings that are walking around. These are memories of the past, a way to show a reflection of what Argus was like before the coming of the Legion. A couple of you also asked me what's up with Valeria's bow, why is she using Tastor? but I believe that she does acknowledge marksmanship hunters using her bow. I would have words with you, Huntmaster. Verisa told me you accompanied her on the mission to Niskara, that you risked your own life to rescue me, and prevented her from falling into the Inquisitor's trap. It is clear you wield Thasdora with skill and finesse. You bring honor to the bow, and to the memory of those who carried it before you. There may come a day when I will have need of my family weapon once again. But for now, at least, I have a different path to follow. Hold Thazdara proudly, champion. Know that you have proven worthy of it. From this point forward, I'm going to talk about the upcoming raid, and I'm going to cover some major spoilers that we know of, the ending of Legion and beyond. So if you don't want to be spoiled, and you don't want to know quite yet, then let me just say thank you very much for watching so far, and have a fantastic day. For those that are sticking around, during part 2 of Shadows of Argus, we heard Sargeras talk to Agrimar. What is your bidding, master? The circle mirrors completion. The mortals must not disrupt. If we look at the adventure guide and we open up Antorus the Burning Throne, we can see that Agrimar is not the only titan that Sargeras was able to get his hands on. Eonar has been able to hide away, but the others, Amanfu, Golganef, Kaskarov, and Norganon, they're currently being tortured by the Coven of Shivara, prepared to be reborn as a whole brand new pantheon. This is one that does not stand against Sargeras and joins him in the mission of scouring the universe of its corruption. That is what they're working on, that is the rebirth he doesn't want to see disturbed. The hour of Rebirth draws near. Are the souls prepared? Our kin still resist the true path, Master. But they will soon be broken. One still eludes us. Her essence is needed to ensure the victory. The Life Binder will soon reveal herself. She will not 
Escape me, master. When my new pantheon rises, no power in the universe will stand against the Legion. Eonar is the last one that they need, the last one to complete their new pantheon, but they haven't been able to capture her yet, and we still have time to help her out. I remember the awakening, how life sprang forth all around us. I remember unity, until it was shattered by betrayal. I remember fleeing, to keep him from his prize. The time for hiding is over. Aid me. Or everything ends. So a lot of people wondered, how exactly is it possible for Sargeras to get his hands on their essence, on their very souls? With Agrimar, you could say, okay, he was destroyed by the Dark Titan, so his soul was still around. But the others, they're described of making their way back to Azeroth and entering the Keepers. This then caused a domino effect, like the corruption of Yaxxaran with the Keepers in Urwar, and Raden's isolation, leading into Le Shen becoming the Thunder King, and then later on, Refion devouring his heart. At this point, I don't know for certain. Perhaps he was able to gather some part of their soul, left behind when they made their escape, and now he's planning to make more little avatars, or perhaps when their powers were expended, expanded from the Keepers, they returned to where their journey began, and that is where Sargeras picked them up. If we try, we can give a spin to it without retconning the Chronicles, and we are going to do our very best to stop this rebirth, stop Sargeras from corrupting Pantheon, and get their aid in dealing with the Dark Titan's plans. That is the main threat, and along the way we have a couple of bosses standing in our way. Garofi Worldbreaker, constructed deep within the core of Argus, and outfitted with an arsenal capable of decimating worlds. This war machine has been designed for a single purpose, to bring the mortal's invasions to its knees. It's a Fel Reaver, with a massive cannon trying to blow us up. Bellhounds of Sargeras, infused with fire and shadow, for Ark and Shatuk are the prized pets of Sargeras. Bred for carnage, these hounds delight in eviscerating the master's enemies. With the army of the light and their allies advancing upon Autorus, the Legion prepares to unleash these vicious creatures onto the battlefield and put an end to the mortal's invasion. Fire and shadow trying to sear our soul, and puppies you do not want to keep next to each other. Then there is the Antoran High Command. Long ago, in the golden age of Eredar civilization, a council was formed to oversee the defense of Argus and maintain peace. But after their dark bargain was struck with Sargeras, these master tacticians used the military expertise to help orchestrate a burning crusade that ravaged countless of worlds. Now the full might of the Legion's army is theirs to command, and they wield this terrible power to annihilate all who oppose the Dark Titan's will. They have command pods from which they can fight, but they also leave one empty to be taken over. And for those that wanted to take revenge for the Zenadar being blown out of the sky, Chief Engineer Ishkar, the one responsible, he is part of this encounter. Portal Keeper Hazabel maintains the Nexus through which the Legion has unleashed its insidious armies upon countless of worlds. With portals that open to a myriad of strategic locations throughout the Great Dark Beyond, Hazabel is capable of bringing the might of the Legion's arsenal to bear upon any who oppose her. She will open up a fiery portal to Zorov upon Valkenar shows up, a fell portal to Rancora to which Lady Desidian shows up, and a shadow portal to Nafreza from which Lord Ilgar shows up. Zorov might sound familiar to warlocks out there, as that's the world where the infernal dreadsteeds and raw seeds come from. Roncora, that's a newly named planet, but since Lady Decidion is one of those spider demons that might be their home world, as Nafreza, that is the home world of the Nafrezim, a planet invaded by Illidan and his demon hunters during the novel Illidan. It was once a world of magic and knowledge, but now a twisted landscape from which none escape. Possibly because Illidan, he made sure to cause so much damage that it suffered the same fate as Draenor turning into Outland. Then, Eonar the Lifebinder. Though she was felled by the Blade of Sargeras, the Lifebinder's essence escaped the grasp of the Dark Titan. After millennia spent hiding in isolation, Eonar's sanctuary has been discovered by the Legion. Should her soul fall into the enemy's hands, Eonar's power of nature and growth will be perverted to make the Burn Crusade unstoppable. The forces of the Legion are going to try and take her out, we must defend her and buy her enough time to strike back. The infamous Imonar the Soul Hunter serves as the Legion's bloodhound, capable of tracking prey across the cosmos. With a vast array of gadgets and traps at his disposal, Imonar has yet to lose a bounty, and he certainly doesn't intend to sully his perfect record by failing to fulfill his latest contract. A bounty hunter recruited to take us out, aren't we special? Then we have King Garof, the design of every Legion war machine that stems from the depraved mind of King Garof. Obsessed with crafting implements of death, 
Kingarov infused his very body into the production machinery so he could more efficiently churn out a never ending supply of destruction. At the behest of the Legion's Dark Master, Kingarov's fever brilliance has developed a new super weapon which he plans to unleash upon the army of the light. He switches between construction and deployment, sending out fell reavers while the automated defenses of his workshop, they rain death upon his enemies. An old familiar face is also found in Antorus, Varimafras. As one of the dreadlords overseeing the Legion forces during the Third War, Varimafras failed to stop the rebellious Lich King. He submitted to an ill-fated alliance with Sylvanas Windrunner, then made one last bid for power before facing a humiliating defeat. In payment for his blunders, Varimafras has been tortured by the Coven of Shivara. The vindictive sister stripped away both flesh and sanity, leaving only a singular desire to inflict suffering upon the mortals who cost him everything. That last bit for power, that was during Wrath of the Lich King, where together with Apothecary Putris, they took over the Undercity and he tried to summon Sargeras. The Alliance and the Horde, they both went in to put a stop to that, and apparently he's been tortured for a very long time. The poor guy is not looking so great, and he has some interesting stuff to say, but we'll get to that later on. Next, we have the Coven of Shivara, the one responsible for torturing Varimafras and the Pantheon. They've proven themselves to be the most depraved and fanatical of all of Sargeras' followers. He entrusted the Coven with the unholy task of twisting the minds of the fallen titans into an unstoppable dark Pantheon. Each sister employs her own signature brand of torture, eliciting screams which echo through the halls of Antorus. It is said that neither mortal nor demon can refuse their whispers, making it only a matter of time before the will of the titans is broken. During the battle, will face two of the sisters directly, while the other two they are torturing the titans and forcing their powers to be used against us. Defeating the tormented apparition of the titans, that is the key to defeating the coven itself and freeing the souls of Amanfu, Golgonev, Kaskarov and Norganon. So we're going to free their souls and we're going to move on to one already taken over by Sargeras to Agramar. Once the noble adventure of the Pantheon, Agramar was struck down by Sargeras and reborn as a titan of destruction. He now stands at the core of Argus, guarding a power that could unmake the universe. Not even demons are permitted to tread within the titan's halls, and any mortals bold enough to trespass, they will be reduced to cinders by Agramar's burning blade, Tasselach. He actually has a corrupted Aegis, remember the Aegis of Agramar that we had to pick up, and this corrupted avatar stands in front of the world soul of Argus. Soon comes the awakening of my brother, Argus. Together, our new pantheon will join the master. In breaking your fettered world. But you will not live to see it. Not much is known about the final encounter in the journal, but we are going to see Argus the Unmaker. Bound, broken, eons of existence, knowing only pain. A shattered soul, fueling infinite evil. The master beckons. Rise, rise. Begin the end of all things. The speaker, Magni, he has heard the anguished whispers of the Unmaker, an emerald star calling out from the darkness. Illyria also dealt with the spirit of Argus, as told during the audio drama. But this time, it tried to communicate. Illyria felt as its raw emotion gave way to something else. Memories. It was sending her its entire lifetime in a single, uncontrolled burst. In that instant, while the corrupted fount of arcane might was upon her, her mind was transported elsewhere. Blink. It was energy spinning out into the cosmos. Blink. It found warmth near a sun, and a world formed around it to protect it as it grew. Blink. Generations of life lived and died upon it. Blink. It was betrayed. It was bound by something powerful. Blink. Pain. Pain. It hurt so much. Its only solace lay within its dream. Blink. They enslaved worlds. They burned worlds. They used its strength to revive their fallen souls. It hurt so much. Blink. They found another. It was much more powerful. 
They wanted to claim it too. Then they would be unstoppable. The Legion set their eyes on claiming the final titan, namely Azeroth, and with it under their control, they would be unstoppable. Apparently, the Legion also used the strength of the Titan of Argus to revive their fallen souls. Now, I actually thought that this meant that they were reviving them at a faster rate, since demons always had their immortality when killed outside of the Twisting Nether. This was true, even during the days that Sargeras was still fighting against them, way before he ever made his way to Argus, and is also the reason why he created the prison world of Mardum to contain the demons rather than simply have them respawn again. Argus is one of those places where you can permanently kill a demon, but then it does seem like the demons killed on Argus that they actually return to Antorus. According to Illidan, when you do the world quest Vagoth to Betrayed, he thinks that the Dreadlord's punishment in Antorus will be severe. So it's a little bit unclear. Perhaps Argaris thought that the demon's permadeath that it's a bit of a weakness for his army, and with the titan Argus under his command, he was able to utilize his power and remove that weakness. Like I said, it's a little bit unclear, but Whatever, we need to deal with the Titan Argus, and the Pantheon is going to help out. There's even a data mind ability called Reap Soul, which says all players are instantly killed. Were it not for the Titans, all hope would be lost. And together, Agramar included, we are going to stand against these impossible odds. Now they're keeping the full encounter shrouded in mystery, but the end result is already known. It matters not. We have lost. Look to the skies! Sargeras will soon undo. All we have fought for! No. We will use the last glimmer of Argus' power to bind him here. The seat of the Pantheon shall become Sargeras' prison. And ours as well. You would condemn yourselves to stop him? A sacrifice must be made. Our world must survive. No matter the cost. The final act will harness the last of Argus's power to imprison Sargeras once and for all. Return home, children of Azeroth. Protect the final Titan. Heroes, I can signal the Titans to begin. Once they start their ritual, there's no turning back. Prophet, what happened out there? Illidan serves as the Dark Titan's jailer. His sacrifice has ended the Legion. At long last, the Burning Crusade is over. Isn't it ironic? The powers from Argus, the being imprisoned by Sargeras, are now turned against him to imprison him at the seat of the Pantheon, and Illidan, imprisoned for 10,000 years, he now becomes his jailer. I'm sure that Mayef is very jealous and will miss her illy willy greatly, but that is the end of Legion, as the children of Azeroth, they return home. Sargeras' imprisonment, that leaves the window open for the Titans and Illidan to return one day, and while the Burning Crusade, that for which the Burning Legion was formed to begin with, that is indeed over, it does not mean the end of all demons. They are now free from their enslavement to Sargeras, as Lofraction put it, and free to do whatever they like. They might find a planet infested with old gods again basking in their power, they might conquer new worlds for themselves, or perhaps some will decide to keep going with their mission against the Void, potentially become allies in the future. The sky is the limit, as always with speculation, and keep in mind that the things we're going to talk about next, they are indeed speculation. I'll do my best to support as much as I can with the information that is data mined and that is known, but all of this is not set in stone. So before we go away, Illidan is going to hand over a couple of farewell messages for his twin brother Melfurion, his beloved Tyrande, and one for us. You have proven your commitment to Azeroth. Your dedication, your sacrifice, rivals my own. But more will be asked of you. So much more. Even now enemies gather, and the shadows grow darker. From this day forward the defense of our world, of all we hold dear, rests with you. And now is not the time to ponder personal regrets. We must see to healing the world, champion. The soul of our world is in agony. In my lifetime, I have twice witnessed a sundering of the world. Mother Moon, I pray I do not see a third. The Legion is defeated, its master imprisoned. But in his final spiteful act, Sargeras may have doomed us all. Our world is wounded, champion. 
Its life essence seeps out into the sands, just as Magni foresaw. Her feelings are a jumble. I need to focus. Let her thoughts flow into... Ah! Sands soaked in pain. Rivers. Rivers of blood. Skies of flame. The sword in, 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 in the darkness. The wound is, is burning. Sargeras. The Dark Titan comes. This mere drop of Argus blood surges with incredible power. The might of a titan. If the blood of Azeroth also proves to be a source of such strength, those who seek to rule this world will stop at nothing to possess it. The days ahead may be dark indeed. For now, go to Silithus. Gaze upon the wound in the world with your own eyes. We will find a way to save Azeroth. I know it. Alright, so something's going to go down with Azeroth and a data mine to Silithus that shows us a wound, which kind of looks like an eye, but more likely it's Sargeras being able to give one last FU to the children of Azeroth as he tries to hurt the titan spirit he's been lusting for for so very long. A broken blade is pushed into the planet, and interestingly enough is that when we did the Magni scenario, some out-of-bound trickery apparently revealed that her beating heart, the location where they keep an eye on her dreams, that was also in Silithus. We can't take that as canon quite yet, but it's pretty certain that the Dark Titan was able to stab the final Titan and she's hurting. The last time this happened was when the Titans ripped the old god Yasharaj out of the planet and the Keepers were forced to patch the wound from keeping her life essence flooding out, creating the Well of Eternity. Many, many years later, this well would become incredibly unstable after the War of the Ancients and this sundering took place. This is the first sundering that Toronto witnessed, then came the Cataclysm with Deathwing breaking through the world, causing the Cataclysm, elements and uproar, massive changes to the planets and she fears for a third one. At the hour of her third death, she ushers in our coming. Yep, it's back to the delicious whispers of Ilgnav, and let's try to decipher them. So this stabbing of the planets, that could be her quote on the third death, the third massive event happening to the planets. The king of diamonds has been made a pawn from the earth. He draws strength, our earth, our strength. Her heart is a crater, and we have filled it. Magni Bronzebeard is the King of Diamonds, speaking for the Titan Spirit of Azeroth, drawing strength from the Earth, but a world with a heart that is a crater, and they have filled it. During the Magni scenario, we heard the beating heart of the planet, and darkness had definitely taken over the place, forcing us to step in and clean it up, a place potentially stabbed by Sargeras. But then, why is Magni their pawn, as he seemingly seems to listen to Azeroth? Well, remember what exactly he has done? He pointed us towards the five pillars of creation, which we needed to seal off the gateway at the tomb of Sargeras. Five keys to open our way. Five torches to light our path. The Lord of Ravens will turn the key. Ketgar, the Lord of Ravens, then used the five keys, the five pillars of creation within the tomb of Sargeras. But our adventures in that place, that led to Illidan opening up a massive rift between Azeroth and Argus, which in turn allowed Sargeras easy access for stabbing the planets. Will the Titan Spirit in Pain be beneficial for the Old Gods? Well, we already knew that one of their prisons was weakening from Zalatov in the Emerald Nightmare. Almost completely gone, as if it never existed. But the rift is deep and vast, and somewhere down there it stirs. Something has changed. The last prison weakens. We must prepare. So are we just talking about Nazov here, or are the other old gods also coming out to play? Will we see the rebirth of the Black Empire? Well, we do have this line. Flesh is his gift. He is your true creator. 
from the Chronicles, we learned that the one responsible for the curse of flesh, that which made the creations of the Titans weaker, more vulnerable to corruption and gave them flesh, that was Jacques Ron. We've seen him poking around in Uruar at the very start of Legion, so he's definitely been active. The only one that hasn't really done much in the expansion, that would be the old god Cthulhu, who's very close to the wounded Silifus. To find him, drown yourself in the circle of stars. And a couple of months ago, someone uploaded a picture from Deep Home on the Reddit page, in which we can see a circle of stars, which has a lot of people speculate that Deep Home or this spot, this is where we're going to drown ourselves, perhaps with the Maelstrom, but as some have also pointed out, that is not the location of Nuzov in the Chronicles. Things change, of course, but let's not forget that we saw a lot of his minions during our questing of Ajir, but we can't be certain that he's somewhere beneath the waves of Azeroth. That is, of course, assuming that the he that they're talking about, that is actually Nuzov, but, you know, this one... Is pretty vague, let's move on to the next one. Its surface blazes bright, masking shadows below. Also one that's a little bit hard to pin down what it's talking about. It could be the things seem fine on the planet of Azeroth, but there's actually a lot of darkness down below the surface. Or perhaps it was hinting at Zera and Anaru, and the recent development with the light that they're not all so fantastic and holy, and they actually have a bit of a dark side. The boy king serves at the master's table. Three lives will he offer you. Some suggest that the Boy King is Raphion, since the Black Dragon has offered us a fair few lies, but I don't remember them having a system of royalty amongst their flights, not to mention that he's not even actually Deathwing's son. Some suggest it's Moira's son, but is anyone really going to listen to what a 8 or 10 year old has to say? Not to mention that it would go against a lot of character development that they had for Moira during Mr. Pandaria, and it would be very left field. I still think that it's Enduin, mainly because it's just too much of a coincidence to have Gul'dan call him Boy King as well. Your pathetic alliance will fall to dust. Your new Boy King will bow down and serve me, as will all of you. That means that we still have some lies to look forward to, which I think the Alliance could definitely use since it's been way too unified ever since the Cataclysm, up to the point where it's getting a little bit boring. Having Enduin in the role as king, trying to fill his father's shoes and failing, not being completely honest, that leaves a lot of room for character development, a lot of room for drama amongst the Alliance ranks. The most recent uproar that they had, that was Greymane going after Sylvanas' Stormheim, but that actually had quite a lot of story and reason to go with it, so it wasn't that much of a drama, and sadly, that's storyline seems to be cut out of Legion. There was quite a bit of build-up between these two, quite a lot of things that Sylvanas was planning with the Valkyr, Eir and Helia, but in the end, all we really got was them going off the towers, while the rest of the Horde and Alliance, they focused on the war against the Legion. Speaking of Sylvanas, this brings us back to the interesting stuff that Vadim Mafras had to say. When we encounter him in his cell, he says, So, your alliance still endures longer than I expected. Though she has already planted the seeds of its downfall, she is patient, that one. When your thrones run red with betrayal, when your holy places burn and the shattered mask hangs above your hearth, only then will you know, and it will be too late. It matters not. You are blind to the true darkness closing in around you. So, she found me at last. Sent her underlings to finish the job. Tell me, when she seized your throne of hides and bones, was your allegiance forced? No. I'd wager you surrendered it willingly, or were convinced you did. It matters not. You are blind to the darkness in your midst. Death claims us all. 
even this had some speculate and wonder about who this she is. Some connected it to Jaina, but I'm going to take it at face value here and believe that he's talking about Sylvanas. The shadow mask hangs above your hearth, that is the symbol of the Forsaken, and Vadim Afras has a lot of history with Sylvanas, asking if her underlings have come to finish the job. Of course, let's not forget that the Shivara, they've tortured him into madness, so the source is a bit shaky, but say that we completely trust him, then some sort of storyline with Sylvanas, in which he believes she will betray us all, our thrones will run red and the true darkness is closing in around us. When we think back as to how Sylvanas sees the throne of hides and bones, then we go back to the moment where Vol'jin was poisoned by the Legion, his end was coming and the spirits told him a name. The lower spirit say death will claim me soon. In the end, death claims us all. But the Horde will live on. I have never trusted you. Nor would I have ever imagined in our darkest time that you would be the one to save us. The spirits have granted me clarity, a vision. They whisper a name. Many will not understand. But you must have part of the shadows and lead. You must be Wartif. In the end, death claims us all. Indeed, Varimafras and Sylvanas. Now sadly, her role as Warchief, that's been uneventful. Possibly because some of the story's been cut out. Now another Warchief up on the chopping block like Garrosh. I don't think a lot of people are looking forward to that. Not to mention that Sylvanas has a huge fanbase that don't want to see their queen go. That's not to say that they can't do anything interesting with her character. Her main objective ever since she tossed herself from the top of Ice Crown, that has been to stay alive. To not return to the hell that she saw on that day. And to help her with this, she made a bargain with the Valkyr, who, in exchange for being released from Bolvar's control, they would take her place in hell and would even resurrect more Forsaken to strengthen their bulwark against the infinite. The small bit that we saw of her in Legion, that was making a bargain with Helia, Queen of the Underworld, in order to obtain some sort of device that allowed her to subjugate Titan Watcher Eir. And as we saw in the Halls of Valor, Eir has the power to create more of the Valkyr. More Valkyr means extra bonus lives and extra manpower to create more Forsaken. That's no real change to her motives, she still wants to stay alive at all costs. But we don't know how much of what she saw, how much of what the Valky told her is actually the truth. When she dropped down from Ice Crown, she landed on top of Serenite, and Serenite is the blood of the old god Yaxaron, so the visions of hell shown to her, they could be false. The Valkyr, all they wanted was to be let go of Bolvar's control, but what they really wanted was to join the Banshee Queen in recruiting more troops for the Lich King. Ice Crown Citadel and the Lich King itself, they've also been speculated to be influenced by Yaxaron. Part of that is because Ice Crown is built up out of Serenite. We see a vision of Arthas inside of Yaxaron's mind, and during Legion, we see Bolvar putting the Death Knights of Acherus to work. Sure enough, their goals lined up with facing the Legion, but at the same time, they are resurrecting more Death Knights, and several quest lines. it shows us that our so-called followers, they are dealing with the Lich King on their own. Rather than have Sylvanas to be a full-blown bad guy, have outside forces influence her. She wouldn't even be here creating more undead, was it not for the hell that she saw, so perhaps it was actually Yaxaron pushing her to go on, pushing the Lich King to create more forces for them, only to have them turn around at the right moment and serve their true master, serve Yaxaron. Could even add a return of Kelfuzad if we really want it. Bolvar trying to go against Yaxaron, have Kelfuzad help him out with that, team up with Ice Crown in the Battle of the North. Bow down before the God of Death! What else do they have to work with? Well, we know for BlizzCon that Jaina Proudmoore is featured promptly as the Warcraft representative. It's highly likely that we're going to see a next expansion announcement during this BlizzCon, and we also have datamined armor pieces for Kal Taras. If we are going to deal with Nazoth, an old god set to be beneath the waves of Azeroth, then a marine state like Kal Taras, that could definitely come in handy. Last time we saw Jaina, she was still not willing to work together with the Horde, and she left Dalaran because of it, and after that, she hasn't really made an appearance. Perhaps she went back to her home of Kal Taras, but it does leave the 
the question how well she's received there. Don't forget that she let her father be killed. It is a marine state, so a direct line of rulers, that's not really a thing, nor does she have a whole lot of experience with naval warfare. She is, however, a very talented sorceress with a lot of connections, so perhaps she could be the bridge into venturing forth into new content, allowing us to explore more islands and different parts of the planet. The Legion wasn't a big enough threat for her to work together with the Horde, so perhaps losing Anduin, the boy king serving at the master's table, perhaps that would be something to push her into realizing, like, okay, our world is definitely messed up, I just lost one of the last things that I really care about. Please, Horde, please come join Kul Taras in our war. Please help us fight against the old gods. Or she's actually serving the old gods, but I really hope not. So with a way onto the sea, we of course have Queen Ajara and the Naga that have been serving the old gods for a very long time. They were dead set on obtaining the Tidestone of Golgonev during Legion, trying to flood the land and take control. Now with their master rising from the sea, their time is now. We could also see Zandalar and King Rastakan, perhaps Vol'jin as Aloha, warning us that things are not what they seem to be with Sylvanas. Something to redeem just killing him off like that and not giving him his time to shine as the war chief. What else we got? Well, what about the Chromie scenario that seemed to be kinda out of nowhere and disconnected from the overall Legion storyline? Someone was trying to kill our Chromie with all kinds of different forces like the Void and the Demons and we had to go to this timeline, a timeline that was not meant to be and we had to save her. Part of being a Bronze Dragon, that is knowing your moment of demise and making sure that time flows as it's supposed to be, regardless if that means you're going to die. In one instance, or perhaps in a future still to come, the Bronze Dragon knows Dormu, he was actually tricked by the old gods into trying to subvert his mortality. As a result, Nosdormu shattered the timeways and he created the infinite dragonflights. We are truly going to deal with the old gods and this is still a future supposed to happen and according to Nosdormu, being Moruzant and being killed by us, that is his true moment of demise. That means we might see the birth of the infinite dragonflight take place. Kafun is located pretty close to the caverns of time and from Mr. Pandaria, we still have one potential vision of the future that never came true. The demise of Suri Dormi as Kairos Dormu watched. Note that I do say a potential timeline, it's not guaranteed to become a reality, but the loss of his mate, that might be something to push Nosdormu into going mad and abusing his powers. How cool would it be to team up with Chromie and Refion and figure out who it was that was trying to kill her, dive into alternate timelines and see what different universes could be like. It's a concept that they used for the novel Thrall Twilight of the Aspects and I would love to see it play out in game, deal with Cthulhu and the birth of the infinite Dragonflight, leading into a full circle of Moruzant showing up through the Cataclysm and Nosdormus to demise. At last it has come to pass. The moment of my demise. The loop is closed. My future self will cause no more harm. Still, in time, I will fall to madness. And you, heroes, will vanquish me. The cycle will repeat. So it goes. Right, so just to summarize all of this real quick, there is a potential storyline with Sylvanas, Yaxxaron, the Lich King and Kel'Fuzad in the north. A potential storyline with Cthulhu and the Bronze slash Infinite Dragonflight in the Southwest. Potential storyline with Nazoth and the Great Seas of Azeroth, Azora and Anaga, Jaina and Kalteras, different islands, more of the world of Azeroth to explore, Enduin serving us free lies and creating some sort of conflict within the Alliance. There is more of course. We have the Ephidios very interested in the Void, Illyria being a weapon of the Void but never willing to hurt her son, Turelian seeing a similar vision of himself with Arator during the audio drama as Arator has always dreamed of. Nyalofa, a realm mentioned by several creatures of the Void. Could this be the domain of the Void Lords? And after dealing with the problems on our own home world, will we finally venture forth into the great dark beyond and explore whole different planets? Speaking of the Ephidios, some of you asked me what potential races they could add to this expansion. And the Ephidios, with all their shiny new models, they could definitely be a thing and are heavily connected to dealing with the Void. The whole reason why they look like the mummy creatures that we see today, that is because of dimensions to all devouring, so that could be a thing, but perhaps better kept for the future expansion as we go into the great dark beyond. The other two potential races, and that's assuming we're even going to get a new race, those would be Murlocs 
and Naga, but both kind of have the problem of not being able to wear old armor. The origin of the Naga and their adventures under the sea that will flow so very well with the story of Nazoth and Murloc serving them also being beneath the waves, what stories they might have to tell. There are of course more races to pick from, but those are like my top three. Now I wouldn't say no to more customization with the current races that we have. For example, give humans the option to also pick Vrijku that we met up with in Stormheim, or the elves with potential Nightborn skin, Tauren with the High Mountain Tauren, sub races that add to the customization. In the department of new classes, same deal assuming we're going to get a new class, we have Illyria pretty much combining a Shadow Priest with a Hunter. On paper, I think that sounds pretty sweet, being able to combine abilities of different classes into one, but I don't think it will work out that well in practice, with keeping the game somewhat balanced. If we are going to get a new class, I would like to see it be a ranged class, maybe that long-awaited mech class that people have been speculating about, with the addition of the light mechs we see in Argus, that could be a thing, but it's very hard to say. As a final note, some have been wondering if we're going to see a massive time skip on Azeroth, considering that time doesn't work the same as we party in the nether. We have Illyria and Torellian fighting with the army of the light for a thousand years, but from our point of view, they've only been missing for around 35. That's the problem with the time skip idea. It's actually reversed. In the nether, we go faster, but Azeroth actually goes slower, meaning that unless our war in Argus took at least 500 years from our perspective, we won't see a massive change on Azeroth. I'm actually going to laugh my ass off if they pull another Warlords of the Draenor and be like, SURPRISE! You all thought it was going to be Void Lords, didn't ya? Nope. WRONG! Go party in Alternate Argus. We have some stuff for you to do there. Ah, that would be awesome. But yeah, I, I can't wait to find out what we're going to see at BlizzCon, and this is usually one of the most fun times to play around in, as in speculation running rampant, and the sky is the limit. Can't wait to find out more, but for now, I think I've been going on for long enough, so thank you very much for sticking with me, and I hope you enjoyed all of these videos as much as I enjoyed making them. Subscribe if you like my videos, leave a like if you enjoyed this one, and until next time, guys. See ya! Oh. I see them. A million, million worlds glittering in their perfection. Oh, but one above all others. Oh. Oh. We have fallen. We must rebuild the final titan. Do not forget. What are you trying to pull? It... it is gone. I don't remember any of it. Oh, none of them remember. The irony. <laughs>